This is an introduction and overview of left heart catheterization. Here is a brief overview of coronary anatomy. Please pause and take a look before moving on. A remarkable aspect of coronary anatomy is the presence of potential collaterals. The images on top demonstrate how there can be collaterals between the distal LAD and the PDA system. And the lower images suggest how collaterals can exist between posterolateral branches of the RCA and the circumflex. The relative location of the coronary ostia, the valves, and the coronary sinuses is shown here. When you engage the coronary arteries, you will be manipulating your catheter in these areas. There are a number of ways devised to name coronary arteries. Coronary angiography for that purpose is no exception. As a rule, the ostium of the vessel is the first five millimeters. The proximal LAD is the segment until the first septal perforator. The mid LAD can be the first half of the vessel after that first septal perforator. The proximal circumflex is the part of the vessel up to the first obtuse marginal branch. The proximal RCA is a portion up to the first acute marginal branch and the mid is the straight portion before the bend into the AV groove. There exist other ways of naming vessels, but please pause for a moment to look at this nomenclature. The major branches of the epicardial vessels are named here. A typical right coronary artery bifurcates into a PDA and a PL branch. In a right dominant system, the PDA is a branch of the right coronary artery. That, by the way, occurs in around 80% of the population. If the PDA arises from the circumflex, then the patient is considered left dominant. A patient is considered to be co-dominant if the RCA gives rise to the PDA only and the circumflex supplies the PL system. There are a number of indications for left heart catheterization. And by that, of course, we also mean coronary angiography. Left heart catheterization strictly just means placing a catheter within the left ventricle to measure the pressures. However, the bulk of the indications can be described by the acute coronary syndromes, suspected ischemic heart disease, including that refractory to medications, certain preoperative patients, and those post-transplant. There are a number of contraindications to cardiac catheterization, but some are more serious than others. Uncontrolled coagulopathy is one such example, as is severe thrombocytopenia. You must be very wary of performing coronary angiography on a patient with a platelet count of less than 35,000. Another contraindication is acute renal failure. Patients in decompensated congestive heart failure are also at great risk, and indeed some will not even be able to lay down flats for the procedure. Some patients will require intubation electively prior to the procedure itself. An interventionalist will consider every patient on an individual basis and will 
do their best to anticipate potential risks unique to the situation. So let's start with informed consent. As you all know, it's a very important document. For one, it's a legal document. And it is also a way to inform and educate the patient about the risks and what's being done. A common mistake when filling out consent forms is to write abbreviations such as PCI or MI or LHC. Avoid all these abbreviations and spell out the full word. I recommend you use block capitals. If your handwriting is anything like mine, it will be much more legible. A very important part of what the physician, in this case the fellow, will be doing is to ensure that they know their patient. So in the pre-catheterization assessment, there has to be an up-to-date HMP from the last 30 days. They should know the data. They should know why the catheterization is being done. If there have been previous cath procedures done, to look at the findings, to look at the films, and to review them with your team members. If the patients had prior cardiac surgery, when and where was it done? What were the grafts? Can the patient take antiplatelet medications? Do they have any surgeries coming up? Etc. Etc. Here is a sample consent form that I have partially filled out. And you can see that at the very top, I have placed my own name as the attending performing the procedure. I have written out the procedure in block capitals in full, no abbreviations. This is to diagnose and or treat heart disease. And I've listed the complications that I believe apply. You can add or adjust this list as you wish. As you describe the procedure and the potential risks to the patient, you will explain to them that you have assessed them to be, let's say, appropriate for radial artery access, but that we will prepare the femoral access sites just in case. Now let's turn the consent form to its back. There is this top portion that relates to them agreeing to receive blood transfusions just in case. Circle that for them and tell them to initial inside the circle. That will help them to find it. Also, you can circle the areas that they're supposed to sign, date, and print so that they can find it easier. Then you can sign your portions above here and the case attending can sign down here. Patients should be NPO based on the following guidelines shown here. All patients undergoing coronary angiography should receive aspirin, certainly at least the night before, but preferably the day of as well. We typically load known PCIs with dual antiplatelet therapy. If a patient is an ACS case, such as a STEMI, i.e. cath lab activation, then they are typically loaded with ticagrelor and aspirin. Holding warfarin before procedures is relatively straightforward. Most people hold it for three to five days and check an INR. DOAX can be a little more tricky, and I recommend that you hold them for at least 24 hours. But particularly with Epixaban and older patients, patients with chronic kidney disease, you might have to hold it for 48 or even 72 hours. Ultimately, I would like all of you to get comfortable with radial access. Many of the problems of bleeding will be much less of an issue when you have radial hemostasis. Finally, we have a number of protocols for contrast allergy prophylaxis, including prednisone 50 milligrams, 13, 7, and 1 hours prior to procedure, although we also have an emergency prophylaxis protocol. Many of these exist within EPIC. 
So let's say you have access and we're going to start the angiography. All your catheters are typically flushed with heparinized saline. You can engage the left main in the flat or PA position with a JL4 catheter, or if you're performing this radially, a JL35, a TIG, or a Jackie catheter. All your catheters are advanced over some form of wire. Now for the new operator, engaging the left main can be relatively straightforward, but not quite so the right coronary artery. The RCA should be first of all engaged in the LAO projection. Typically, the ostium of the RCA is a little lower than the left system ostium. A popular catheter to engage the RCA is the JR4, and as you will see on the next page, this catheter does not automatically face in the direction of the RCA. So I have here for you a JR4 catheter. This one is five French in diameter. One thing you should know is that with any catheter, if you're going to turn it, there's no point trying to turn it on a shaft like this. All catheter rotations are done on the hub. You can hold it like this, or a version of this and turn the catheter here. And notice that as you turn the hub, the tip of the catheter is turned as well. Now imagine that we have transradial access, although this could be femoral, and we have advanced the JR4 catheter in. The first order of business is to advance it over a J wire into the aortic root and by the aortic valve. You remove the wire and hook up to the manifold and you're now ready to go. You have the JR4 in place. The pen that I'm showing you on the left is the simulated origin or ostium of the right coronary artery and we have to engage it. So in my right hand I'm holding the hub which I'm going to control and here is the catheter. Now something you have to appreciate is that for me to turn my catheter to face the RCA, I have to turn this clockwise, like this. I'm exaggerating the motion to show you, so there you go. And as I do so, as I turn this clockwise, the JR will start to turn towards the ostium of the RCA. There is just one slight problem. The JR4 does not always behave the way you would expect it to. In many cases, as you are clocking the hub down here, that guy over there will not budge. And then all of a sudden, it will whip around several times. And the reason for this is because of the way it transmits the force and there could be friction in the system. There are a number of ways to stop that whipping from happening and to improve transmission of force. One is to do what I call the revving technique, where you clock or rev a little, and then you let up just a little. So you clock about two thirds of the way and you unclock a little to take the tension out. And as you do so carefully, what you will see happen in the heart is that gradually the catheter will start to face the RCA. Another way to transmit the force is that as you're doing this turning, to pull up and down on the catheter to free it from the walls. That can also reduce friction and encourage it to fall towards the RCA. As if that wasn't enough, if you end up below the origin of the RCA such as this, it rarely helps to just pull it back up. What you have to do is to undo or counter clock and keep countering, keep countering, keep countering until it comes back facing the aortic valve and then you have to pull it up and then start to clock again to encourage it to come back and fall into the ostium of the RCA.
The catheter that you use is ultimately connected to a pressure transducer and that will pick up the pressures that are at the catheter tip. You would expect to see an arterial waveform similar to the one on the left. It may have a dichrotic notch, but if you encounter a ventricularized or damped waveform, that could suggest that the catheter tip is up against a wall or an obstruction, and in that setting, contrast injection should be entirely avoided, and the catheter should be gently withdrawn. Serious complications are happily quite rare with coronary angiography. However, it is important to know how frequent they are and how to manage them. With care and meticulous technique, vascular complications and access site complications can be minimized in coronary angiography. With radial access and or the use of ultrasound, safety can be improved significantly. I would like to finish this cath lab introduction by providing you with this cheat sheet. This was put together by one of our cath lab nurses at Yale. I would encourage all of you to use it for your pre-procedure workup for your cath patients. Good luck and welcome everyone.